in a culture saturated with entertainment and media. Many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script was 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself was very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage.
in a culture saturated with entertainment and media, many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome. Very friendly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If Genesis got it wrong, how can we trust the rest of the Bible? At the Institute for Creation Research, we've spent almost 50 years researching the science behind Genesis. Our investigations range from geological formations of the earth to human chimp DNA similarities, from soft tissues and dinosaur fossils to the mysteries of galaxies, quantum mechanics, and dark matter. With every discovery, the case for biblical creation grows stronger. ICR just launched a fantastic new resource to showcase our scientists' research. The ICR Discovery Center for Science and Earth History is inspiring the next generation with the wonders of our Creator and teaching them how to view science and earth history from a biblical perspective. Thank you for supporting ICR. All gifts will support our scientific research and educational programs. Together, let's help students, ministry leaders, and families hold fast to the truth of God's Word, from the first page to the last. Hello, my name is Sam Braun, and I will be presenting the Gospel of Acts to you in the 2011 NIV version. First of all, I'd like to tell you that I like audience feedback. Remember, for these miracles and sermons that I will be retelling for you, these were some of the most influential events in the history of the early church. They are the spark God used to jumpstart what we see today. So if you feel compelled to give an amen or a whoop, and what you hear, it is welcomed. I highly recommend, if you are confused at any point, that you pull up a map of Paul's missionary journeys. 
His journeys are from chapters 13 through 20, with the fourth journey occurring in chapters 27 and 28. These maps are very easy to find online. I presume some of you will need it, since most of us are not ancient geography experts. Um, also, we will be taking two intermissions during Acts. One after chapter 12, the first section from 1 through 12, essentially summarizes the church's growth in Jerusalem. The second intermission will be after Paul's missionary journeys, concluding after chapter 20. The last segment is Paul's imprisonment and trial, and that will take us to the end of the book, all 28 chapters. A little background about me. I am from the city of Buffalo, New York. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my hometown swag. <laughs> but we are not here to celebrate or pledge allegiance to one earthly city. For ultimately, I am a citizen of God's kingdom and not just a citizen, a servant. And I am a servant who today will humbly present to you the gospel of Acts. My interest in memorizing scripture can be traced back to my involvement in Bible quizzing as a teenager, of which many of you have heard of that program. But today, instead of quizzing, I will merely be proclaiming God's word and let the exclamations and miracles within speak for themselves. Please bear with me as I settle in beneath the bright lights of this stage. And please relax and just bask in the wonder of the gospel of Acts. Beginning with Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up, stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our numbers and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For said Peter. It is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, 
A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, <laughs> They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. 
Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this was to fulfill what God had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until a time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen must be completely cut off from their people. One second. <laughs> okay. Okay, gotcha. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. For, for, um, for he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came out to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard their message believed. And the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Aeneas, the high priest, was there, as was John, Alexander, Caiaphas, and other members of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought in and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given to, under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and ordered them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. 
He spoke long ago through the mouth of our, um, your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and its rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city, conspiring against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your will and power decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was not a needy person among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as they had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she replied. That is the price. Peter said to her, How can you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell at his feet and died. The young man came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought their sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, there was no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain, the temple guard, and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. On hearing this report, the officer went with his, um, the captain went with his officers and brought in the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have 
filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. But Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. On hearing this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and in order that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thea disappeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been considered worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. On to chapter 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas, Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed many signs and wonders among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at the time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Later, Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. 
Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made Joseph ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. Then Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. Around this time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. When he was 40 years old, Moses decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When Moses saw this, he was amazed at the sight. As he went over to get a closer look, he heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals. For the place we are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who spoke to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have lifted up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rephim, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses, according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God had driven up before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses built by human hands. As the prophet has said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked people. 
Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. <coughs> when he said this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke, <coughs> broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in that city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave them their attention and said, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when the crowds believed Philip as he proclaimed the, kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished at the signs and miracles he saw. When the church at Jerusalem heard that, the, that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Then Peter said, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord that he might forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When Peter and John had further proclaimed the kingdom of God and testified about Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasure of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go up to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? The eunuch asked. Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. 
Who could speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch asked, Look, here is water. What could stand in the way of my being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azatus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Night and day they kept close watch in the city gate in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how he had preached fearlessly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took Saul and brought him to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit and increased in numbers. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said, Jesus Christ heals you. Now get up 
and roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Around that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Leda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Leda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them and was taken upstairs to the room. All around him the widows gathered, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by her hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius! Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is known as Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. When the angel who had spoken to him had gone, Cornelius sent for two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice came from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was still wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit told him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Now get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a devout and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them. Some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, they arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him stand up. (laughs) Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter entered the house and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why I was sent for? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house, praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send men to Joppa to bring back Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, 
but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know everything that has happened in the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee from the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by those whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he was raised from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets who have spoken testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, What could stand in the way of their being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he gave orders that they be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, as well as wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice told me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice came from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remember what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even on Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, Jews from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Judea to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw this met with approval among the Jews, 
He proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains while sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, <laughs> he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it, it, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now they joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But... The word of God continued to spread and flourish. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. That's the end of 12. We are going to take five minutes, and I will be back for Paul's missionary journey shortly.
Welcome back. Um, I will be doing chapters, again, reminders, chapters 13 through 20 for the bulk of Paul's missionary journeys. If you are confused about any of these locations, I recommend you pull up a map. The first journeys, chapters 13 through 14, second, 14 through 18, and then the last one is 19 and 20. <clears throat> with that said, we will pick up again with Acts chapter 13. Now at the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There, they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God, of our people, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. When the people asked for a king, he gave them Saul, son of Kish of the tribe of Benjamin, and he ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you were looking for. But there is one coming after me who sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death penalty, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had fulfilled all that was carried out, when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who traveled with them from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he would never be subject to decay. As God has testified, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. And as it is stated elsewhere, 
You will not let your Holy One see decay. When David, had, um, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Listen, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and encouraged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw these crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. But Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this, this is what the Lord has commanded us to do. I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of God spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them, and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and withdrew to the Laconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. At Lystra, there sat a man who was lame, he had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet! At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form! Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gate because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are telling you good news. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn away from these worthless things. To the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, God let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. 
Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the whole church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice that the Gentiles would hear from my lips the message of the gospel and belief. God who knows the heart, shows that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he gave to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now, so then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became quiet as they listened to Paul and Barnabas telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described for us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and we will rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles may bear my name, says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. So the whole church, with the apostles and elders, decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some of our own men and send them to you with our dear friends Paul and Barnabas, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas with you to confirm to you by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid such things. Farewell. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Silas decided to remain there. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit all the believers in the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. 
Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had, a deserted, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and did not continue with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, while Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of God. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The disciples at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders for the people to obey, and the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. Once she and all her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we met a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned out and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Once her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. After receiving these orders, the jailer put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were, worshiping, were, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are all here! The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When daylight came, the magistrate sent officers to the jailer with the order, Release those men! The jailer said to Paul, The magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, They beat us publicly without a trial, 
even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting that they leave the city. When Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and for three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble, all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, one called Jesus. On hearing this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the, and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a large number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews at Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, while Silas and Timothy remained at Berea. Those who were escorting Paul brought him to Athens, and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All of the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing except talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I can see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked about and looked carefully, at your ob- looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And that is why I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inherit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this, did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he calls on all nations everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We would like to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people there became followers of Paul and believed. 
Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, as well as a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. After this, Paul left Athens and went on to Corinth. There, he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. On the Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed him and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next, next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you. For I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in at Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. But Galileo showed no concern whatever. Paul stayed on at Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centre because of a vow he had taken. They landed at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home, where they explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road to the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Tell me, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they replied. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, Then whose baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Then Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul placed his hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, and they had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. 
This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many who believed came forward and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. It was about this time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, My friends, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray many of the people here in Ephesus, and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, but the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and they all rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense to the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image which came from heaven, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, but... They have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything else you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what has happened here today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. Acts 20. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and, after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sobatar, son of of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus, and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later arrived in Troas, where we stayed, 
seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and arrived at Mytilene. Um, the next day we set sail from there and arrived off of Chios. The day after that we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the day I first came to the province of Asia, I served with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. For I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, being compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. <sighs> Now I know that none of you whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Be shepherds of God's flock. That's not it. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the will of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's gold or silver or clothing. You know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs as well as the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. That's the end of Acts chapter 20. We will take intermission number two, five minutes.
<laughs> there we go. Welcome back. We have uh, eight more chapters to go, and this is going to be Paul's trial. So we are going to continue at chapter 21. Acts 21. When we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kaz. The next day, we went on to Rhodes and from there to Patera. We found a ship crossing, crossing over to Phoenicia, went aboard and set sail. After setting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. There we found some brothers and sisters and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. Then we said goodbye and went aboard the ship while they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we saw the brothers and sisters there and where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Jerusalem. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, in this same, the Holy Spirit says, in this same way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owners of this belt and will hand them over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? In the same way, no, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Manasseh, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. When we came to Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach our people who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. So what shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have taken a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth to these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused, and people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple courts, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the, officer, the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, 
He ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, Get rid of him! As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the wilderness some time ago? <laughs> Paul answered, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, Listen now to my defense. When they heard him speaking to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as both the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Then I asked, what shall I do, Lord? Get up, he said, and go into the city. There you will be told everything you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and was respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his well and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be as witnesses to all people of what you have seen and heard. So what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to beat and imprison those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him! He is not fit to live. While they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? He asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate Paul withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed because he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So the next day, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, 
I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. When he heard this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me in accordance with the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul answered, My brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of my hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out in the Sanhedrin between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees believe all these things. There was great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the high priest and elders, the chief priests and elders, and said, We have taken an oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the rest of the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So we brought him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What does he want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul over the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken a solemn oath not to eat or drink anything until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with, the, with this warning. Don't tell anyone you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He then wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias. To His Excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to find out why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge deserving death or imprisonment. When I found out about a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to appear before you to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with them while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked which province he was from. Learning he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered Paul to be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was brought in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. 
Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would ask, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him and we were going to judge him in accordance with our law. But the commander Lysias came and took him from us with much force, ordering his accusers to appear before you. By examining him yourself, you will learn the truth of the charges we are making against him. The other Jews join in this accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been judge of this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple, nor was I stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are bringing against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God that these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I went up to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts to the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonial, ceremonially clean when they found me at the temple doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me as I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When I see as the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and to permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix arrived in Caesarea with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, hmm. Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went, to, went down to Caesarea. The next day, he convened the court and ordered Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, they made many serious charges against him, but could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Would you be willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong against the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving of death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges made against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice 
arrived in Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there's a man here whom Felix kept as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews um, brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it's not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When some of them came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I was expecting. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion, and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he'd be willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He said to him, Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day, King Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officials and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I defend myself against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so, since you are well acquainted with the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people have all known the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. It is because of the hope of what God promised their ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise that the 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I had to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I threw many of the Lord's people into prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus and the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among all those who are sanctified through faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, 
I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice since it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray that not only you but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with him. When they had left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramatium, about to sail for some ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Snidus. When the wind would not allow us to hold our course, we, passed, we sailed to the Lee of Crete opposite Salmon. We made slow headway... No. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lassia. Much time had been lost, and by now sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, decided to follow the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught in the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Fearing we would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul, said to them, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong, and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God. It will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. 
On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed we were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing we would be dashed against the rock, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the water, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and his soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, we cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you all to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from your head. After Paul said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea while at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to the land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul picked up a pile of brushwood and, as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and saying nothing unusual happened to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and, after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day, we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there heard we were coming and traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called for the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, he said to him, My brothers, although I have done nothing wrong against the, our people, or the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I sent for you to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and None of our people who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. 
He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the book of Moses and the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. After he said this, the Jews left, arguing vigorously among themselves. For two whole years, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Gospel of Acts. In a culture saturated with entertainment and media, many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script is 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself is very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking 
drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage. In a culture saturated with entertainment and media, many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. 
When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script was 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself was very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage.
in a culture saturated with entertainment and media. Many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script is 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself is very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage.
In a culture saturated with entertainment and media, many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script is 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself is very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage.
in a culture saturated with entertainment and media. Many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script is 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself is very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage.
The book of Romans, King James Version. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God, which he had promised the four by his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we are, are given grace and apostleship, obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, by whom also you are called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, uh, Lord of God, and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit with the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention of you my prayers night and day. For I long to see you, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. For I am there both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the power of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed against heaven from all unrighteousness and ungodliness of man, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest into, to them, for God has shown it to them. For the invisible things of him from the creation world are clearly seen, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain imaginations, and the foolish heart was, jock, was darkened. Pretending themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like made like to corruptible man, and to birds and for four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up unto cleanness to the lust of their hearts to do the things which are inconvenient, who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is overall blessed forever. Amen. This cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even the women to change their natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their hearts one toward another, men with men doing that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, envy, murder, deceit, debate, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, without understanding, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, that those which commit some such things are worthy of death, not only do them, but have pleasure in them which do them. Chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, Whosoever thou art that judgest, for when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest do the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, which judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who shall render every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and good doings seek for glory and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to them that do good, to the Jew first, and also the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons for God. For as many as have a sin without the law shall also perish without the law. And those who sin in the law shall be judged by the law. 
Not the hearers of the law shall be justified, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature things contained in the law, these having not the law, are law unto themselves. But show the work of God in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts either accusing or also excusing one another. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things which are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself, that thou thyself art a blighted guide of the blind, a light of them in darkness, an instructor foolish, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge and doctrine in the law. Therefore, therefore, with teachers another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou make sacrilege? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of Gentiles is blasphemed through you as it is written. For circumcision very profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou break the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not the uncircumcision which is by nature, if you keep the law, judge thee, who by the law and circumcision transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Chapter 3. What advantage, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God in that effect? God forbid. As is written, Yea, let God be justified, and every man a sinner. But what if our unrighteousness command the unrighteousness of God? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God has more abound through my line to his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not r rather, as we be slanders reported and some affirmly say, let's do good, let's do evil, that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No one no wise, for before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, they're all under sin. As it is, writ it is written, there is none good, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They're all going out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none to do good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With the tongues, they've used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are shift to sweat, shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. For there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things are of the law saith, it says under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith in Jesus Christ, and to all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, his righteousness, that he might be just, and to justify him that believes in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by law of faith. Therefore we conclude the man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is God, God the God of the Jew only? Is not also the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing as one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Chapter 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he is wherefore the boast, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. 
Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the, described the blessing of the man whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are covered, whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Come this blessing is under circumcision only, or upon un- uncircumcision also. We say that faith is reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be uncircumcised, that righteousness not be, might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to them were not only the circumcision, but to also to those who walk in the steps of the faith of that father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham as to his seed through the law, but to the righteousness of faith. For if they of the law be heirs, faith is made, is made void, and the promise made of none effect. For the law works wrath, for there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that might be by grace, that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not that only which is of circumcision, but also those which is of the faith of Abraham. As it is written, I have made thee father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those which be not as though they were. Who against hope, believing hope, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but strong in faith, gave him glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to accomplish. Now it's not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but the also, also to whom it shall be imputed. If we, we acknowledge Christ as our Lord, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by grace, with peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations work patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame, for love of God is spread about in our hearts to the Holy Spirit which is given to us. For when we are yet without strength, in due cry, time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commends his love toward us, in my, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being saved by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. For until the law of sin is in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him to come. But not as an offense, so also is the gift. For if the, through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abound to many. And that is by, not as by one that sinned, so, as, so also is the gift. For the, for the gift was by one, the sin was by one to condemnation, even so, by many offenses, the life is in the justification. For if by one man's sin, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift and righteousness shall reign in one by Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, as by the offense of one, uh, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Therefore, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, even so by one man's obedience, many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that offense might, may abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that is, sin has reigned into death, even so grace might reign in righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6. 
What then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How there are we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know you not that some man is baptized in Jesus Christ, or baptized his death? Therefore we are baptized in his death, that we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. For if we be dead with Christ, we be also shall live with Christ. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more power over him. For in that he died, he died into sin once, but in he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead into sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign your body, that ye should be in his lust thereof. Neither yield yourselves members, your, your members, servants to iniquity and to sin, but yield, yield yourself to God, of those that are alive from dead, and your members, servants of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under the grace. What then? Should we sin because we're not under the law, but under the grace? God forbid. Know you not that whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to obey, whether of sin and the death, or obedience and the righteousness. But God be thanked that you have obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants to righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your heart, that as ye have yielded your bodies to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members instruments of righteousness to God. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what fruit had you in those things of which you are now ashamed? For any of those things is death. But now being delivered from sin, you have your fruit unto righteousness and the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over man so long as he liveth. For that woman that has a husband is bound by law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she be, shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, we also have become dead to the law by the body of, body of Christ, that we should be married to another, even him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we are in the flesh, the motion to sin, which are by the law, that work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead we're, wherein we are held, that we might serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all kinds of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. For the commandment is good, and the law is good, and, and or ordained to be good. Uh, was then that which was uh, good meant to be sin for me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, by, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, so under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Now if I do not, not if I, that I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find out. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil that I would not, that do I. So if I do not, uh, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find, find that in law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Why delight in the law of God after the inner man? If I see another law in my members, bring me cap captivity to the law of sin in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve, serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Chapter 8. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that was weak in the flesh, God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned in the flesh, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us to walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the carnal mind, for to be carnal mind is death, but to be spiritual mind is life and peace. For the carnal mind is enmity against God, but the spiritual mind is life and peace. Excuse me. So that they in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of Christ dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if, if Christ dwell in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised Christ from the dead also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are, we are to live after... Uh, we're not, we're dead, not to live out of the flesh. But if you live out of the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as led by the ch- Spirit of God, they are the children of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified with him. Far back into the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature is made subject to vanity, uh, not of its own, but because of the sin of man. Because the creature also shall be live from this bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain again until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees is why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. The Spirit itself uh, helps our infirmity, for we know not how we should pray, but the Spirit makes an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And he that searches the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit, for he makes intercession for us. And we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them that are called, are called according to the purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate that he might be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom we did predestinate, then we also called. Whom we called, then we also justified. Whom we justified, then we also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered us up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything in charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ that rose from the, came from the dead. Who is he, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril of sword? Nay, as it written, for thy sake we are accounted sheep for the slaughter. Nay, and all these things are more than conquerors to him that loved us. Thank you. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks for the water. <clears throat> Chapter 9. <clears throat> I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, 
For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, for Israelites to whom I obtained the doctrine and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the service of God, whose are the fathers, and of, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Now as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. Neither because they are seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they see be called. That is, they which are children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, and this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but Rebekah also, when she can have conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said, The elder shall serve the younger. As is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, <clears throat> I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Scripture says unto Pharaoh, Even for this purpose I raise thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be glorified throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy in whom he will, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest thus against God? Can a thing form? Say to him that form me, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power of the clay, the same, of the same lump, to make one vessel for honor, and other dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, hath endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, and that he might show the riches of his glory on his vessels of mercy, which he has prepared for glory, even unto us, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles? It is thus also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which are not my people, and her beloved, which are not beloved. And you know, so come to pass in place where it was said to them, You are not my people, that there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah said also before, though the number of children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For the Lord will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, for a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah had said before, except the Lord of, so Lord of hosts had left us a seed, we had been made like Sodom or made out into Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which fall not after righteousness, have attained unto righteousness. But Israel, which fall after the law of righteousness, have not attained the law of righteousness. For they sought it by works, not by faith. For it is written in Zion, I will lay a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, but he that believeth on him shall not be stumbled. Chapter 10. Brethren, my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to righteousness. But they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of righteousness, there one that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness of the law, that the man which doeth these, these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith is on this wise. Say not, thy, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend to heaven? That is, bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend to the deep? That is, bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we believe. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. For scripture says, Whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is rich over all to them that call unto him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, How beautiful are the feet of them which bring the gospel of peace and bring good, glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? 
Yes, verily, the sound went in all the earth, and the words to the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, I will provoke to them by not no people, and by a jealous nation I will anger you. By Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them who sought me not. I was made manifest unto them which asked not after me. But the children of Israel said, All day long I stretched forth my hand to a disobedient and gainsaying people. Chapter 11. I say then, has God cast away his people which he foreknew? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets, and dig down the altars, and I'm left alone. I'm the only one, and they seek to kill me. But what saith the answer of God to him? I reserve to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, this time also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, there's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of work, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more works. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath attainment, and the rest were blinded. As Cornelius has written, God has given them the spirit of blindness, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. hear. <clears throat> David also said, Let their table be made a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, that their eyes be darkened that they might not see, and their ears be darkened that ears that they not hear. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. For the fall of them being the riches of the world, and diminishing them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. I speak to Gentiles inasmuch as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I provoke, might provoke some of them which are my people, and might save some of them. For the casting away of them being reconciled in the world, what shall the receiving of be, them be but life from the dead? For if the fruit, first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted among them, and with them partakes of the root and fatness of olive tree, olive tree boast not against the branches. But thou boast, thou bearest not the fruit, but the fruit thee. Thou wilt say then, they are broken off, thou might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they are broken off, and thou standest by faith. Uh, so if, 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 the, if, behold therefore the goodness and severity of God, toward them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continuest goodness, otherwise thou also shall be broken off. For if thou were broken from a wild olive tree and grafted into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own tree? I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceit, how the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer who shall turn away God ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant unto them, when I shall heal their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are bluff for, the God, for, for God's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, but now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so these also now believe not God, that they through your mercy might obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon them all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are your judgments, and your ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given unto him, that should be recompensed to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, 
according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For if we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, with the prophecy, let's prophesy in accordance with proportion of faith, or ministry, let's wait on our ministry, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. <clears throat> let love be that dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave that which is good. Be kindly affectioned to one another in brotherly love, and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which curse you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend the men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in sight of all men. Dearly beloved, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place unto God. For God has said, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists, resists the power of God, resists the ordinance, resists the power of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves judgment. For rules are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the same? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of him. But if thou do evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain, for he is a revenger, a minister of God, to execute wrath on him that do, does evil. Wherefore, he must be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually on this very thing. Render therefore to all the dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves one another has fulfilled the law. For this, Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be other, any other commandment is briefly fulfilled in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill towards neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let's therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put on, put on Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Chapter 14. Him that is weak in the faith, receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he might eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him eat not judge him that eateth. For who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he should be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, and another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth to the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. He that eateth not, to the Lord eateth not. For none must live unto ourselves, and none must die to ourselves. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. For this, to this end Christ died and rose and revived, that it might be Lord of living the living and the dead. But why dost thou judge thy brother? But why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us will give account to God. Let us not therefore judge one any, another anymore, but judge us rather that no one put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded of the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean in itself, but to him that esteems to be unclean, to him it is unclean. 
But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not with thy meat thy brother with whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For in this, he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable of God and approved of men. Let us therefore fall after, fall after things which makes for peace, for with me we, we may edify one another. <clears throat> For me to destroy not the work of God, for, for all, all things are clean to him that believes. Therefore it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor do anything whereby thy brother is offended, or stumble, or is made weak. Has all faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemns not himself in that which he allows. But he that doubts is condemned if he eat, because he is not in faith. For what is there was not of faith is sin. Chapter 15. We then are strong, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, for it is written, The reproaches of those who reproach me fell on thee. For whatsoever things are written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one to another, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. <clears throat> now I say that Jesus Christ was a man of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might praise him for his mercy. As is written, for this cause I will come unto the Gentiles. And again he saith, Rejoice, you Gentiles, of this people. And again, praise the Lord, you Gentiles, and laud them all the people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and in him shall Gentiles trust, and they shall praise his name. Now the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace and believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also have persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written unto you more boldly in some sort, that you might receive me, because I, and apostle of the Gentiles, I want to magnify my office. I do not speak of those things which God has not wrought by, by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word or deed. Through mighty signs and miracles, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I fully preach the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I preached the gospel of Christ, not where Christ is so named, lest I should build another foundation. But as is written, to whom he has not spoken, they shall see, and they shall not heard, that not heard shall understand. For which cause I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now having no place in these parts, and having desired these many years to come unto you, once wherever I take my journey to Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you my journey, if first I be filled somewhat with your company, and you might bring me in my way thitherward. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to provide us a gift to those in Jerusalem. For the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to communicate to them physical things. When therefore I have finished this gift, I will come unto you on the way to Spain. I am sure that when I come to you, I will come with the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for your love of the Spirit, that you pray to God for me, that I may be delivered from those who don't believe in Judah, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. <clears throat> Chapter 16. I command, you, I command unto you, Phoebe, our servant of the church which is at St. Korea, that you receive from the Lord as become a saint, and a sister in whatever business she has, for she has been a secure of many, and myself also. Greet Priscilla and Quilla, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have, my, my sake, laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also churches of Judea. Read also churches in their house. 
Salute the well beloved Eponius, who is the first fruits of Achaean the Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much love on us. Salute Ananicus and Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Mary, which bestowed much love upon us. Salute um, Herodian, my kinsman, and uh, me, salute Urbane, our help in Christ Jesus, and Stachys, our beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute uh, uh, excuse me. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Uh, greet them which are of the house of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Phosa, Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, who labors much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, changed, chosen Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrodes, and Hermes, and all the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nears and Sister, and all the saints which are with them. Greet you with one of the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause the visions, the visions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they are such, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the sinful. For your beings have come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but I would have you wise in that which is good and simple concerning evil. Now, if God of peace shall stample shall trump Satan on your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timotheus, my work feller, fellow, and Lucius, uh, my Lucius, Jason, South Spirit of my kingdom, kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, wrote this epistle, salute you. Gaius, mine host, and of the whole house, salute you. Erastus, chamber of of the city, salute you, and quarters of brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Now to him that has power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of everlasting God, made known to all nations for being of faith, to God only wise be glory, through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If Genesis got it wrong, how can we trust the rest of the Bible? At the Institute for Creation Research, we've spent almost 50 years researching the science behind Genesis. 
Our investigations range from geological formations of the Earth to human chimp DNA similarities. From soft tissues and dinosaur fossils to the mysteries of galaxies, quantum mechanics, and dark matter. With every discovery, the case for biblical creation grows stronger. ICR just launched a fantastic new resource to showcase our scientists' research. The ICR Discovery Center for Science and Earth History is inspiring the next generation with the wonders of our Creator and teaching them how to view science and earth history from a biblical perspective. Thank you for supporting ICR. All gifts will support our scientific research and educational programs. Together, let's help students, ministry leaders, and families hold fast to the truth of God's Word from the first page to the last. In a culture saturated with entertainment and media, many people are so distracted that they have trouble engaging with the Bible. That is why Piercing Word is on mission to ignite passion for the Word of God in the heart of the church through live scripture performances. As theater professionals, we are passionate about coming alongside Christian leaders in order to engage their people with God's Word in creative and powerful ways. When I called Piercing Word, uh, they immediately helped me select a scripture performance that fit perfectly with our sermon series. They were very affordable, and they even provided all the marketing we needed to help advertise for our event, which was great. On the day of the performance, uh, the Piercing Word van arrived with all the sets and props and costumes, sound equipment, and the Piercing Word ministry team was awesome, very friendly, and had true servants' hearts. The script was 100% word for word from the Bible, and the performance itself was very innovative and powerful. Uh, it's amazing how linking drama and scripture, how it spoke beyond a simple reading. So everyone went away impacted, including myself. Numerous people came to me and told me how they were moved to tears and how they were impacted and, and how they were inspired to get back into the Bible. So I'm very thankful Piercing Word came. I highly recommend their ministry. We perform at churches, 
conferences, outreach events, and more. And all of our scripts are arranged using only the biblical text. We engage people through live scripture performances. We encourage everyone, everywhere we go, to memorize God's word for themselves and to take their next steps with God. And we equip people with resources for life transformation through Bible memorization and study. I never cease to be amazed at how powerfully God speaks when we let God's word speak for itself. We look forward to partnering together with you to bring God's word center stage. Thank you.